Hi, everybody. My name is Jay Agner. Welcome to the First Customer Podcast. We talk to founders about, you guessed it, how they got their first customer. This episode and every episode is sponsored by my company, JDAQA Software Testing. We're your one-stop shop for manual, automated, performance, and security testing. Check us out at JDAQA.com. And with that, let's get on with the show. Hi, everyone. My name is Jay Agner. Welcome to the First Customer Podcast. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Drew Griffin from Lead Bubble. Drew, how are you, buddy? I am excited to be hanging out with you, and particularly because I know that you are a Philly guy, and uh, I love the hat, man. It's really good to see you. Thanks, man. Uh, you know, it's a good time for Philly sports. The last few years have been good, so, you know, uh, just fingers crossed the Phillies can kind of keep it up this year. Yeah, well, well let's, let's, here's the hoping, right? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, so, uh, you know, you have a very extensive background. You've, I love uh, having people in that have co-founded or founded a bunch of different stuff. I mean, Neato Media, Delicious Marketing, Everlinks, Group X, Lead Bubble, uh, and we can kind of get into all that stuff. Um, take me back to the start. Where'd you grow up and kind of, uh, you know, how'd you, how'd you get through high school and college? Where'd you go? Yeah, so uh, Philly born and raised uh, around the Olney, Long Crest section. Uh, ended up going to St. Joe's Prep in Center City, Philadelphia. And by way of that, I uh, ended up at Philadelphia College of Textiles and Sciences, which now, uh, kind of transferred into Philadelphia University, and now it's Thomas Jefferson University. Uh, all good. Very cool. Um, so where did you go after college? We kind of talked a little bit beforehand, uh, maybe a little bit of a different path to tech. Uh, how, how did that start for you? Yeah, so long story short, I ended up uh, getting into healthcare, uh, particularly in nursing. I was a wound care specialist, uh, nurse, uh, wound care nurse specialist, particularly in hyperbaric medicine, uh, which basically means I work with uh, some of the worst of the worst uh, types of injuries and disease processes like burns and uh, de- debilitating uh, chronic wounds and gunshot wounds and the bends, people that were dive underneath, get this disease process for, for divers and carbon monoxide poisoning, all that kind of stuff, right? So 26 years in that, um, I spent a lot of time working with people at their very worst. Uh, and at, towards the end of that career, uh, I guess the point of this podcast is more on the technical aspect of things. Um, you know, I, I, I guess working in that industry um, re- either hardens you or really helps create a, a, semp- uh, a sense of empathy. And I did over a number of years, but along those lines, I experienced a lot of trauma, right? You see people at their worst every single day and, you know, you contribute to, you know, touching uh, countless lives by helping patients every single day deal with uh, co- comorbidities and, you know, problems that they've been having in their lives. And um, over that time, you know, um, you see some opportunities as well. And fast forward to 2010, 2011, around the advent of the iPhone, I realized very quickly that um, everyone was going to be carrying one of these things, right? One of their mobile devices. And uh, I ended up developing one of the first apps to help diabetics track their blood glucoses and their blood sugars. Hmm. And it was pretty cool, right? So it was, you know, it was a very basic type of application that helped them track some of their blood values, their activities, their meals, so they can share it almost like a journal type of application that they could share with their physicians. And within the first couple of weeks of that, we saw uh, about 40,000 downloads. And I realized my time in the clinical wound care and healthcare setting was over. (laughs) Um, so I gave my resignation and it was kind of fun. I walked in to my boss, who was not a very good person, um, particularly gave me some of the hardest cases that, that were out there. And I think that was uh, good for me to some degree uh, to deal with adversity. Uh, but the fun part about it was I gave my resignation. I said, hey, I've got some good news and some bad news. And, you know, she intuitively knew the bad news was I was resigning so she pulled me into this office where there were uh, a bunch of my colleagues, physicians, other nurses, and advanced practice nurses, and that sort of thing. And uh, I think uh, her duty or what she was trying to do was embarrass me, but she said, uh, all right, so Drew, you're leaving. Uh, what's the good news? And I said, well, I just saved $500 of my car insurance by switching to Geico. And uh, the, the entire room uh, erupted in laughter and, and so on and so forth, but um, the security of knowing that 
this fledgling application and software, I, I realized right then and there that uh, I could probably touch a lot more lives with emerging technology than I ever could, you know, in a clinical wound care setting. Right. So, yeah, that so that kind of started things off. And, you know, between uh, 2009, 2010-ish until now, uh, a lot has happened in between uh, kind of the goal, goal post. So it's been fun. So... Twenty, you had the twenty. You did twenty six years in that, and then you kind of stepped out into the tech world. Is that kind of how that worked? Yeah, yeah. So I've always been uh, interested in tech, uh, kind of programming in the background and messing around and tinkering and and that kind of stuff. And coming from uh, you know family where uh, my father was an entrepreneur and did all that kind of stuff, I, I think I had a little bit of that in my blood. Mm-hmm. And I just uh, you know. I, I sought out to really help people in, in healthcare. And I think I did that quite well. Uh, but, you know, being a, a fairly new dad and all that kind of stuff, I always missed out on a lot of, you know, family time and uh, events and things of that nature, always working, you know, 12 to 16 hours a day uh, in healthcare. Uh, that really kind of sucked. And, or, or at least working outside of the home was, mm-hmm. uh, was difficult. So, uh, transferring and uh, trading that into kind of a, a world of entrepreneurship where you're working probably a lot more hours than that, uh, but on your own terms and at your, you know, your own schedule was super appealing to me. And that's kind of where things went uh, aside from wanting to touch a lot more lives with, you know, technology and marketing and all the cool stuff that we're into these days. Um, yeah, it's been a little bit of a ride. Did you, how, how was that transition for you? How did you kind of handle going from the nine to five or the nine to nine or whatever it was, you know, you were working to having your own schedule and kind of having to deal with the family and kind of still working, but enjoying that, that family life. Like, how did you make that switch from the, from the grind to the entrepreneurial lifestyle, which is still a grind. Like you said, it's just a different grind. Yeah, it's a different grind. Um, but yeah, at, at first I didn't handle it very well. I needed to kind of figure some stuff out and, you know, uh, form the entities, you know, the legal entities for business and all that stuff that I didn't really understand how to navigate. But uh, I'm a big fan of kind of outsourcing and surrounding yourself with people who are much smarter than I am or, or that we are or whatever uh, to to help me along that pathway. And as a result of doing that, um, I can focus in on the things that I'm really good at um, and come up with some new things to kind of solve some people's problems, some business problems and um, leverage technology to do that. So, yeah, it was a little bit of a transition, but, you know, it happened rather quickly uh, to the point where, you know, we've been running a business for quite some time now that's been developing software and we've got a marketing and education side to our, uh, you know, to one of our companies and uh, whether we're doing you know, some of the coding and <clears throat> Or dealing with, um, you know, our team. Or right now, I, I do very little coding whatsoever. Um, in between my business partner and myself, we have an amazing team of developers who who make it infinitely easier for us to kind of um, have the vision for what we want to produce and create, and kind of solve that problem out in the marketplace. Um, very cool story. So you went from your diabetic diary app i'll call it uh to uh did you jump into media and kind of um marketing stuff directly from that or was there some transition there yeah there was a little bit of transition but you know as a result of uh, it maybe striking some lightning you know right out of the gate um you know there weren't very many apps on the app store at that given time Mm -hmm. so pretty much anything that got out there got a, a lot of attention and as a result of that, um, you know, having that being acquired, um, that was pretty cool uh, opportunity to kind of go through a process like that, which I wasn't really prepared for. Um, but after that, I kind of realized that there's something to this whole social media and marketing and leveraging the internet to get your word out about the stuff that you're doing. And I got really good at that. And uh, so I started working with some uh, local businesses and uh doing some things with SMS text marketing and that sort of thing and helping people understand the technology of building lists and working with customers and clients in a little bit of a different way. When you're able to communicate with people, 
using and leveraging technology as opposed to having to restart that process of you know acquiring a customer, serving that customer, and then going out and finding a new one um, was extremely exhausting. So kind of um, getting into more of the lead generation aspect of, of the world um, and then being able to communicate with that list over and over and over again um, is infinitely easier than going out and trying to find a, finding a new customer. Mm -hmm. It was really kind of the motto and the things that I was really kind of attracted to moving forward. So we started creating softwares and solutions and education on how to actually do that. Um, you know, with uh, some some of the emerging technology that was out there, how do we leverage these tools to do this a little bit more effectively? And uh, yeah, that's kind of what we've been doing ever since is creating kind of creating some small micro applications that did just that, did something very specific for um, a democratized price that everybody could technically afford and get them an end result that they're actually looking for, right? Without having to try to figure out um, everything on their own, we more or less became technology partners to local businesses and other local marketers that were out there in the world. So it's been, yeah, it's, that's kind of where Very we are cool. right, right now. Um, <clears throat> What would you tell someone that is thinking of being acquired or has been approached? What would you what would be your number one piece of advice to somebody new to that process after going through it yourself, kind of not knowing what was coming? Clean books. Make sure that your books are clean and that you've got your process uh, down, uh, particularly in technology. I think what's really good is you build a list of customers and that those customers are recurring. Um, there's lots of different interests from, you know, people or businesses or VCs or uh, private equity firms and that sort of thing that are interested in uh, many different factions of businesses, whether it's cash flow or it's a list of customers and clients and that sort of thing. Uh, sometimes they just want to acquire you for the list of customers. Sometimes they want your technology um, so I think clean books, clean lists, and being able to communicate that effectively, um, on, on a ramp up is probably the best thing that I could probably recommend. Yeah. I like that. That's a, uh, <clears throat> I've heard similar things. That's a, that's a clean books is a great number one. Um, so you went and co-founded a bunch of different businesses. Um, kind of walk me through, you know, after you made your exit to how you got to lead bubble. I mean, like I said, it looks like you had a bunch of different, uh, uh, businesses you started and stuff. Um, what was the process and kind of what did you feel like you had when you kept creating these new you know businesses you were co-founding? What what was the process you went through there? Yeah, so I think we leaned in on um, a marketing firm. We, we had a really good way of building lists and actually doing you know getting results by actually doing the things that we were teaching. So we started an education side to our company. We started creating. Uh, online courses and more or less just being transparent about the results that we were getting and teaching a group of people, uh, businesses, other local marketing agencies, people that were interested in that, like, how are we getting those results? Primarily, like, how do you get your foot through the door to communicate with local businesses? Um, so we, we started uh, working on things like that and created a number of different courses to do something very, very specific that a lot of startup companies like local marketing agencies, social media marketing agencies, and that sort of thing. They want to work with local businesses. So we did the work. We started actually working with local businesses, getting them results, and then kind of sharing those results back to our community. As a result, we started building a list, building a list of customers that were interested in our educational courses. And then as we started to find problems, we started creating micro SaaS uh, little products, right? So we started launching some of these little products like Everlinks, which mm -hmm. was a link in bio service kind of like um, Linktree, right? We took Linktree's idea. We love those guys. And we believe in a model uh, in, a, in a, a process called model and improve. Mm -hmm. so we took that product and more or less um, built into that product some things that Linktree didn't have, like video. And then embed codes, right? So you can take a, a checkout form. Maybe you're using a product like SamCart or perhaps ThriveCart or 
something along those lines where you can just take one of those embed codes and then take that form and embed it within the link tree. So you basically have a, a little micro website service that, um, you know, allowed people to create link in bio type of, of pages very, very easily, very, very quickly, kind of click and paste type of deals, made it super elegant, easy to use. So we were the first to do that. And we realized that, hey, if we can model and improve upon existing models, that there's a market there that you can kind of go faster, cheaper, a little bit, little bit better features. Um, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel per se, but, um, you know, adding to that process. Mm -hmm. So we started seeing success with stuff like that and did really well. We built an, a, 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 a sizable list of uh, people that wanted to use our software and then ended up exiting from that as well, uh, primarily for the same reason people wanted access to the list of the customers and clients. And we just built a community around the SaaS itself and show people how to actually use this in a, in a very interesting way. Uh, we learned a lot uh, from you know the deployment of that. We created a couple of other things like GroupX, which is a Facebook group extension that helped generate lists from people actually joining your actual um Facebook groups and you, you build, as someone joins your Facebook group, you're actually grabbing a, a, the lead, right? The name, the email address from mm -hmm. somebody that actually lead, you know, jumps in there. And uh, we just started tinkering with some of these ideas. And uh, my business partner came up with the idea for Lead Bubble uh, a few years back. Uh, he saw this little widget that was happening on people's websites. He's like, you know, this is really cool, but what if it did this, 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 and this? Mm -hmm. And kind of staying true, true to, hey, this is really cool, but what if it did this, 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 and this? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of like, hey, how do we solve this problem? So we, we created the application for ourselves um, initially for us to use internally to market our business, to generate more leads as people came to our website in a little bit of a different way. So Leadbubble is a website widget that is a video. It pops up and warmly welcomes somebody to your website and then leads them to take an action. You know, so for you, Jay, with your, your organization, if, a, if you popped up on the video uh, and in the lower right-hand corner, think of it as a chat widget, but it's an mm -hmm. actual video of you 30 to 90 seconds, and you more or less welcome somebody to the website and then lead them to do what you want them to do on your website, whether it's to call you, maybe uh, schedule to be on your podcast, find out a little bit more about your services, your uh, your software re reviews, and that sort of thing. Like You want them to do something very specific. So it's basically a CRO play, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're trying to convert them. And what we found was... Um, the the stick rate and the number of people that were opting in and communicating with us uh, started to increase significantly. And then we started to bake some other cool stuff into the inside where uh, you can you know have them call you directly from your website. You can have them uh, opt in. You can connect your own uh, CRM if you wanted to. A whole we we basically play in the sand very nicely with a lot of other applications like. Mm -hmm. Messenger and so on and so forth. Um, we've got a, a an agency side to it, which is primarily our main focus, where people can white label our software and run it as their own to generate monthly recurring revenue. So a lot of people that are in this space, they're always trying to find ways to generate more revenue. How can we create a, a SaaS of our own without having to go out there and hire a dev team and spend you know a couple hundred thousand dollars in development? Right. Um, they can just start right off the bat for a low nominal fee and white label it and call it their own. Start generating revenue that way by helping an existing roster of clients. So we we launched the white label side of that and we haven't really looked back. It's been a lot of it's been a lot of fun. So well, that was a lot to unpack there, but um so you're white labeling in a sense, so if I wanted to if I wanted to sell lead bubble to my clients. Is, is what you're talking about, right? Okay. Yes. Very cool. Correct. That's a great idea. Thank you. Um, love that. So taking a step back to your first acquisition and your first exit, or your, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, who was your first customer in that sense, right? Because there's a, 
you consider them a customer, right? Because they are coming to, to purchase something from you. It just happened to be your entire application. Um, was that through some, you know, uh, venture network? Was that through some sort of like, you know, people you knew? Like, how did you even get on the track of exiting that original? Uh, and let's walk through a couple of these to kind of talk about who your first customer was. But how did you get people in, in, interested or did people approach you about acquiring um, that first application you built, the, the diabetic one? Yeah, so uh, th- there are two really um, different audiences, right? So it's the user of the application. Uh, so, you know, 40,000 people, you know, whether they're physicians or patients or family members, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know the names or the email addresses of any of those folks. Mm-hmm. It was all directly done through Apple uh, and Android. So that... Um, you know, so on one side you have the user of, uh, in terms of the customer, right? Th- those were my customers, and then the acquisition was—I um, really can't mention it, uh, but they reached out to me. So okay, uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of these can say, be can be generic. I'm just more curious yeah. about how how that happened. Um, but you said they reached out to you, right? Yeah, they just reached out to me uh, through a website. They literally had a, a telephone call and said, "Hey, we're really interested in this." Um, are you interested in selling? So I was like, yeah, <laughs> let's get, let's do it. And away, and away it went. Um, so what about some of these other ones? Uh, you know, uh, maybe even just jump into lead bubble. Um, how did you, did you leverage your existing list that you had, you know, from these previous engagements, these previous companies that you had just to kick lead bubble off to kind of get the ground, you know, get, hit the ground running? Yeah, so a, a great way to, to do that, I mean, I think the, the fortuitous part for us was that we had an existing roster of customers and clients, both in the local space as well as uh, a community of other marketers that we have sold information products to, uh, court, online courses that were well aware of our teaching style. Uh, we had a baked-in level of trust. Uh, and along the lines, we did a lot of... Uh, Kind of joint venture and affiliate marketing, where we had uh, you know some partners that we trusted, uh, people that did amazing things in the space. They had software of their own, and there's always opportunities to do joint ventures where hey, they've got a list of customers and clients who would probably be interested in our product since they've got similar types of products or they work in the marketing space. So right off the bat, being able to launch to an existing roster of clients, roster of customers. Um, you know, helps you scale from day one. Of course, we've gone through lots of different versions and we've added some new things to the software over time. But because it's been uh, a SaaS, um, both on the retail side as well as on the um, uh, white label agency side, we have an existing roster of clients and customers that once we release it, they continue to pay us over and over and over again, or we can put them onto a webinar to, to show them, hey, we've just came out with something pretty cool. I think you guys are going to love it. Um, and we've been very fortunate in that way where we don't have to start from scratch each and every single time that we have a new product or new version or new, um, you know, uh, a new feature within the application that we can launch and let people know about it. Um, so yeah, that model seems to work quite well. Um, my advice being if, if you've got uh, a community, if you can build a community that, uh, you know, know, like, and trust you and you're providing a level of transparency that each and every single time that you come out with a new product or a new service or new version of those, um, you'll do quite well. Talk to me a little bit about the community side of that. When you say build a community, how do you build that in a genuine way without, you know, uh, people being afraid to, you know, be part of something they're just going to get sold at? Like, so, you know, so where, how did you build a community? How would you start a community like that today? If you had to, you know, you got a new product, you're going to go build one. You didn't have the existing community to leverage. How would you go about building a community like that? Yeah. So we have, uh, we have a course, it's called, uh, local media hero. And when we first launched this, we, um, we, we, we were facing some problems in, in the initial stages of running our marketing company. And that problem was um, the Me Too syndrome, right? And uh, I, I guess that is like, hey, there's just a lot of competition out there. 
people that, you know, come out of nowhere and say that they're social media experts or local marketing. Like you don't necessarily need a degree uh, to, to hang, you know, to, to hang out on your shingle, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and we faced a lot of competition where people were competing on price. We would come in, we were able to get results. We were very good at what we were doing. We were doing SEO, we were doing website development and all kinds of, you know, uh, stuff that local businesses need. And it was just a race to the bottom. So through Local Media Hero, what we decided to do is kind of flip this switch. And we said, you know what, we're not going to go out there and um, um, prospect right away. We're going to build an asset and we're going to command a lot of attention in a local area, which obviously every local business would be very interested in. Um, local businesses advertise, they have to market, they're doing social media, they're doing all that kind of stuff. But what we have found pretty much across the board was there was this uncertainty of like, how do we build our accounts? How do we build out our Facebook page? How do we do our Instagram? How do we build an email list? And there was this disconnect. We saw a lot of people were having that struggle and people were competing on that. So what we decided to do was actually create something a little bit different. This is kind of the fun part. We decided to create a local news and events moniker. And that was more or less, hey, let's focus in and build a local community that was interested in what most mattered to them. News, events, uh, crime, weather, uh, memes, right? So basically what we did is we created a page in, in, in our local area. It's called Pottstown. So I created a page called Pottstown Local News and Events, which then became Pottstown Local Scoop. But Effectively, in a town of 17,000 people, we command about eight to 10,000 people, meaning, hmm. meaning they've liked our page, they follow our page, they engage in things that we're putting out there. So we flipped the switch a little bit. Instead of us going in and you know, knocking on the door and saying, hi, my name's Drew from such and such marketing company. I'm here to sell you my stuff. We went and started to approach people like, hey, I'm Drew from Pottstown Local News and Events. We would love to feature you and your business on our Facebook page. We've got about mm -hmm. eight to 10,000 people. There's a little bit of a switch there, right? The nuance is, hey, I'm not here to sell you some stuff. I'm here to give you some attention. Right. And we proved to them in advance that we could give them all the attention that they could really handle by doing local business spotlights and actually doing the work in advance. So we took that model and we just started sharing it with people in other marketing communities. And as a result of that, showing people that we were actually getting results and what they could do too without having to spend a lot of money, we, we, started, uh, we started a movement where we were very transparent, showing people transparently what we could actually do to get those types of results. And because we were actually doing it, where we're actually taking selfies and videos of ourselves, actually at the, instead of just theory, we were showing people we were actually doing this stuff and introducing them to the businesses that we started to work with. That built and baked a lot of trust into mm -hmm. who we were. So we, we gave that course away for free, or at least the first iteration of that. And since then, we've had a number of different iterations to actually help it amplify that much further, get things, get results a lot much more quickly. The exact formula to do and replicate what we did in that area. Since then, we've built out another, I don't know, 30 different pages in the local areas up and down Route 422 here in southeastern Pennsylvania and out towards Pittsburgh. So in each and every single time that we relaunch this little uh, challenge, this little course, if you will, we get the exact same results. And because of that, we can leverage that to actually connect with local businesses, be cool about it, mm -hmm. and actually get them the results that they're looking for in advance, which then bakes in that trust. Right. So that trust that we're talking about there is kind of what we do inside each and every single course and every piece of software that we release as well. And that's how we build that community. Wow. Uh I think calling it slick would make it sound like it was, you know, uh, you know, disingenuous. But I think it is genuine, and I think that's a really uh, smart and cool angle to take. So, um, I'm a huge community guy and a huge community builder of things. Like I have just, I've found that I really enjoy doing that. So it's good advice to somebody um, to take in a different angle than the traditional, like you said, knocking on doors and, and beating somebody down and being annoying, um, you know, from the jump. Um, if you had to kind of 
fast forward to today, knowing everything you knew, to restart Lead Bubble, uh, with all the stuff you've learned over your career, what would be step one to starting starting a business like yours? So I think um, starting uh, with the end in mind is, and be patient with yourself as you start to develop something like this. Like there's a lot of appeal to monthly recurring revenue from a, a SaaS product. Mm -hmm. um, it has you do whatever you can to democratize the cost that it takes to to build something like this. So trying to find a white label solution where you can generate monthly recurring revenue is a good opportunity is, is I think is a very smart way to deploy a business like this. If somebody wants to get started independently and on the side, um, focusing in on sales skills is really, really a big key. It's something that I shied away from from a long time, but it's a true profession where you have to be able to communicate with people effectively and be able to actually help them solve the problem. Um, and if you're solution, your software, whether it's lead bubble or some other type of solution, um, you know, the widgets and the, the dials and the software does only so much. Um, if you're trying to build out a website or you're using a certain type of web builder or something like that. Yeah. You can build a website all you want, but in order for you to actually sell that website, you have to communicate with those customers and clients. So I would highly, highly recommend working on uh, sales skills, find a sales trainer, somebody that can help you uh, navigate and get your sales process down um, is probably the foundation that every, every business owner really truly needs. Because at the end of the day, if you can sell, it doesn't matter what you're selling. Um, if you can sell, then you'll have an actual business and not just a hobby. Um, Moving fast forward, you know, fast forward, particularly for, you know, a SaaS product like, like Lead Bubble, you know, make sure that you surround yourself with some super smart people. If it's just you, make sure that the software or the solution that you're trying to create is, uh, you know, something that you control and that, um, you know, can, can, uh, can expand and, and really deliver and solve some problems for people. I love that. Um, I have heard... I mean, it's, as, as, a, as a business owner, it's easy to have some success while shying away from learning how to do sales. And then, like you said, to kind of unlock the potential of whatever it is you're selling, you have to, first of all, admit you're a salesman, right? Like a lot of the time it's, I, I say this with a lot of these podcasts, but like I read somewhere at some point, it's like, you know, name the five, five, top five things you think of when you hear the word salesman. It's like a pest, like annoying. It's like all these things like, and people don't want to be that, um, but your stuff's not going to sell itself, right? And I think that was one of the biggest pivot moments I had with my business was like realizing, like, oh, I am a salesman and I have to learn those sales skills and I have to read books and I have to, you know, talk to people and do that sort of thing. So uh, I love that as being kind of step one. Um, all right, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, what are three healthy things you're trying to do to increase your longevity? You know, you're just, just, you know, dietary, physical, mental, whatever it is, what are three things you kind of live by or are trying to live by um, to kind of keep you around for a while? So um, there's two that I'm focusing on right, right now. Two's fine. I'm not, not going to make up the third. <laughs> um, so uh, I started doing intermittent fasting yep. and I lost 125 pounds. Ooh, wow. So uh, it's something that I, I continue to do. Uh, I struggle with it, right? Uh, but you know, being in the healthcare field, I, I felt a little bit of a hypocrite because I, I gained so much weight. And working with diabetics every single day, I was like, you know, yeah, that's just something that happens to somebody else. Well, the problem that here, at least in the United States, is a lot of people don't realize the problem with insulin uh, resistance and insulin sensitivity. But the magic pill for me wasn't necessarily a pill or insulin or anything like that. Um, I ended up uh, applying for life insurance for uh, an infinite banking policy, and I got denied. Uh, as a result, uh, I took a look at my labs and realized that okay, yeah, I'm like pretty well, I'm pretty much a diabetic or was a diabetic, and um, started doing intermittent fasting. Uh, I saw this guy; his name is Chris Winters. Taught a lot about intermittent fasting, and it was literally a hack that saved my life. 
So about a year, a year and a couple of months, I lost 125 pounds simply by doing intermittent fasting and walking um, and getting better sleep. So those are the two things. Um, I am now what they call um, a polyphasic sleeper. That means I sleep several times throughout the day. I'll take naps, much to the chagrin of my wife. She's like, what are you doing? I'm taking a nap. But what I find is after I take my nap, I get up and I do my best work ever, right? I get up and boom, I crank out. I work, work for about an hour and a half to two hours and I'll go take a nap, um, kind of like a bear or something. Uh, but it works for me, right? I, I, it's my Whatever excuse. Whatever works, man. It feels great. Intermittent fasting and uh, polyphasic. Well, I tell you what, you lost 125 pounds. Congratulations, by the Thank way. Uh, that's a huge uh, accomplishment. Uh, I think I'll let you, you, you can skip on the third one since you lost 125 pounds. I think that's fair. Um, a lot of really good stuff, man. Uh, I, I think we'll end it there. Um, you know, I, I hope people check out Lead Bubble. I will probably check out Lead Bubble. I was looking at it before this, um, and it looks like a nice little hook for, um, you know, especially a lot of service companies that want to get their message across quickly. It looked like a, a really good fit. So uh, I'll definitely be checking that out. Uh, if, it, if people want to find you, find Lead Bubble, uh, what's the best way to do it? Yeah, the best way is, uh, is if you're a retail client, it's uh, leadbubble.io. If you wanted to uh, check it out and generate some monthly recurring revenue for yourself, get leadbubble.io and uh, you'll connect with either myself or my business partner, David. Uh, Califiori, and uh, we are the guys that you'll be speaking with, and we'd be elated. Uh, just let us know that uh, you you heard this through Jay, and we'll make yeah. sure you get a special deal. There you go, get a special deal, and I'll get Lead Bubble free for life, and everybody will be happy, right? So <laughs> awesome. Well, let's do it. All let's right, uh, awesome. Thank you, Drew. I really appreciate your great guest, man, uh, and I uh, hope to catch up with you again soon. All right, you got it, Jay. Anytime. Take it easy, buddy, man. See you, man. Later.